It's a beautiful day in Cleveland, Ohio, and just five miles from here, downtown, the spotlight is on as people party at the Republican National Convention. But right here, they're still grieving, the loss of a young black life. Tamir Rice was 12 when cops shot him down, playing right here behind me. His in this city is not the only death, as you'll hear. And death is a topic. At the Republican convention, the rhetoric is targeting those who fear the death of middle class chances and white working class jobs. There's a reality to that too, in a city where average family incomes are half the national average. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we are live in Cleveland, Ohio. A city that's hurting, in a country that's hurting. Who is speaking to all this hurt? At the end of the day, it really comes down to protecting and putting America first. I voted Democrat my whole life. It's the first time I'll be voting Republican. All of us are brothers and sisters, and we stand together for the same issues. So I'm here to ask you, please vote. The homeless rate has increased, and we see no mechanism that's being put in place to help people not to become homeless. What appeals to me about Donald Trump is he is a businessman. What's moving people is, is just justice. Not, like I said, it's economic justice, man. 99% versus 1%. For the middle class America, how is this election going to help us? Here at the Republican National Convention in Cleveland, it seems as if no argument resonates more with people who support Donald Trump's candidacy than the argument that he'll deliver on a promise of jobs and security and making Americans feel great. Why does it resonate? Here to talk about that, we have Harriet Applegate from the AFL-CIO here in the Cleveland area, and Jim Mason, who makes NASCAR tires at a Goodyear plant in nearby Akron. Jim, welcome. Hi, how are you? So tell us a little bit. You work for Goodyear in Akron. Um, what do you do? What's your work? I'm the unit president for Goodyear for the steelworkers in Akron. And um, when I hired in 1995, we had over 3,000 members, and now we're down to about 250. Is that part of why a message of a promise of jobs is resonating, do you think? Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, Donald Trump talks a lot about bringing jobs back to America, um, but we need to get the word out that, you know, we think it's an absolute lie because he could be making products here now, his own products, his shirts, his ties. What about you, Harriet? Can you tell us a little bit about Ohio? I mean, this is an extraordinary moment to be in this city, which has been in the U.S. history such a critical part of yeah. the American industrial story. Yeah, this is a this is a working class city in in the uh, in the middle of the Rust Belt. We make things here. In fact, still 20 percent of our local economy uh, depends on manufacturing, which is much higher than elsewhere. And uh, we're hoping to get some more of that back. But yeah, this is you know people are desperate for jobs and they're desperate for sustainable wages. That's what's really been missing. Now, Trump's promise is to restore trade barriers and keep immigrants out. Um, will that work? Will that help, well, do you let's think? Go to, let's go to wages, for starters, because Trump has said that workers make too much money. He has actually said that America's workers make too much money. So, and he's, he's solidly for right to work, which basically drives down wages, st statistically. And so, Right, th right there is lie number one. He can't, you can't make America great again when people make such a small amount of money. They, they don't make livable wages today. What about this question of, of trade and uh, immigration, though? The steel workers have filed many trade cases and got them pushed through this administration and that, that's helped the tire industry and the steel industry. So you'd like to see more kind of defending the country from abuses of trade. Yes, ma'am. Trade's flooding, not the problem. Flooding the market. It's the abuse of the trade. It's not being on um, equal, equal playing ground or level playing ground. 
So what about the other aspect, I think, that we've heard here at the convention floor, but certainly is out there, which is this kind of rank appeal to race and to white privilege. Why does that work so well? I think, think, it, I think it works because um, you have, you know, people who work for a living, the working class and the middle class haven't seen any increases in their wages for, as I said, three decades. And so they're looking for, you know, s some miracle. People in the middle class have, uh, are hurting and they, you know, they're struggling and they, you know, they want to send their kids to college. They can't afford it. Um, they they want to you know maybe get a, a, a larger house to because their families increase they can't afford that and so people are unhappy they see this tremendous concentration of wealth in the hands of the one percent and now they know about it mm -hmm. you know it was going on anyway but now people know about it thanks to Occupy and thanks to Bernie Sanders and and so people are very well aware of 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 how there's plenty of money in our economy, it's just not coming to them. Do you hear any of that in, in the community in which you work and live, Jim? Is there anything you'd add? Well, everybody understands a trickle-down economy just doesn't work. The people are keeping their money, or they're offshoring their money, or they're, they're using um, that money to build plants offshore. Uh, we, don't, we don't see it getting invested in any of the communities or the infrastructure of, of uh, manufacturing. But there is, I think, to that appeal to race privilege, something significant that I, that I really do want us to, to grapple with a bit. Um, because it's been in American history forever. Uh, how do you divide the working class? You put black against white, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's amazing to me that we're not still over this. I mean, that we're not yet over this, uh, but we're not, clearly. Uh, we have levels of violence in, in this community and across the country that disproportionately affects African Americans. Um, over 560 police killings, shootings uh, of black men in the last year alone. How do you address these issues if and when they come up with the people that you work with? Um, as far as in the shop, we have, we have less strife than I think anywhere else because we've, the labor movement has fought for years to take away inequality whether it be from women back in the 30s, the 50s, to um, minorities. Uh, we, all, we fight for equal wages, we fight for equal rights, we fight for equal benefits. So that gets to what unions do that sometimes isn't reported on that much. Right. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's very important that unions, I mean, it, you know, we, we bargain a contract and the bargain unit, everybody makes the same. And um, that's the fairest way to go about it. So if everybody were unionized, we wouldn't need an equal rights amendment because we'd have equal pay for equal work. But um, yeah, that's not that's not very well appreciated what unions do in terms of, of, equal, of leveling the playing field for all people and treating everybody the same. What cheers you up most about what you see out there? Even coming out of this election, can anything positive come out of it? Well, I think it's, it's gonna uh, give unions uh, really motivate unions to, to drill down and educate the members and interestingly we, we do this every election we should never stop you know it should be a 24-7 uh, uh, effort but um, you know it's interesting because beyond race and gender the one difference that you that you see in people's voting patterns is whether or not they're in a union so we do a pretty good job already and we're gonna do a much better job going into the future well, let's leave it there. Thank you both. It's great having you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. We, Prophets of Rage, and you are going to march for the In Poverty Now March on that street right over there. Let's go. As Republicans gathered in downtown, activists and members of the Cleveland community held their own Peace and Justice Summit. Over the past years, decades, the sort of democracy uh, window has been shrinking, narrowing, and the ability of us 
through conventional forms of activism, education, advocacy, organizing, is becoming more difficult, or what economists call a law of diminishing returns. <laughs> needs to focus on the issues that, that affect low-income people, and poverty is a real issue here in this city. If you just look around the neighborhood where we're standing now, we have abandoned homes, we have some homes that have been rehabbed, but this is indicative of most of the neighborhoods outside of the center core, so we have a lot of work to do here in Cleveland. There's not a march that's in the reaction to Donald Trump. But it's a, it's a reaction, not a reaction, but it's action uh, because it's both of the parties because they're not even listening or even speaking to either the poor or the downtrodden or those who have no voice. In November 2014, Tamir Rice was killed right here in this park. But 10 days before Rice was killed, Tanisha Anderson, a 37-year-old mom, was also killed in police custody while her family watched. They say her case, like so many other African-American women killed by police, slipped through the cracks of our public attention. Who's paying attention to who's slipping through cracks? Who's blowing the whistle on what's happening in our society? Those are the questions at the heart of this election. But is the process getting to any answers? I believe if, um, if it, it had got the publicity that it should have got, his life might have been spared. You know, because you can't come on a to a situation and don't de-escalate it, you, you're supposed to de-escalate the situation, not not go from zero to a hundred, and it, that doesn't help the problem. And in Tamir's case, he didn't really have a chance, you know, it was like a couple seconds and it was over with. In my sister's case, she had a chance, but the officer that killed her didn't give her a chance. This is just a... Uh rough situation you know we had a couple phone calls that were made uh, for assistance um, we got the wrong assistance you know, when I look at it at the end of the day I don't want to get too much off in the details but uh, it turned out tragic it turned out tragic you know, she was mistreated you know uh, civil rights basically violated you know forced into a situation that she had every right to resist and not want to go. She wound up dead because of it. It's pretty rough. She needed assistance. Why did she need assistance? She was basically having a real bad day that day. Some things had transpired um, with her. She had an operation and, and um, you know, one would think you would you would think by now, after a year and a half or close to two years, it would be easy to talk about, but it's still not easy to talk about. You, I've been asked this question so many times by so many different people, and it's still not easy to talk about. So why do you put yourself through the pain of answering the question? Why do you think so? The wrong? world will know. You have to. You have to say it to get it out there. You have to say it to make people understand what could happen to one of their loved ones by the police, by making a person that has rights not want to do something, especially if they're not armed, um, they're not threatening anyone, they don't have a weapon. That is their right to say, no, I don't want to do this, or no, I don't want to do that and then in turn to be made to do it. And then on top of that, you die from it. That's what the people need to hear. In the 
wake of what happened, people referred to her as having had a mental illness? Well, that's touchy right there because I feel like people are focusing on the mental illness that she had opposed to the person that she was. There's a lot of people walking around here with mental illness. As I said, it's a chemical imbalance. It's something that they didn't ask for. It's just a chemical imbalance. It's not to say they're crazy or they're off the rocker, but who fights for them to have the right balance? Somebody has to fight for them to be on the right balance. And if they should tilt over that day, knowing that they have been on the right balance, it takes something very, dram very dramatic to tilt them over. So it's not like they walk around just crazy, mentally ill people and, and don't know what they're saying or don't know what they're talking about. It's not like that. Your case is ongoing, and the particulars of your case are really important. But I also want to say that so much of what you've said and what I've heard you say when we've talked before goes way beyond your personal case. Yes. Who's getting assistance? Who's prepared to give assistance? We're in the middle of an election campaign. Right. Are people talking about the important issues, in your view, in this election? Joel? It's a lot of promises that's going to be made so everybody can maneuver to get where they want to be and then we'll see what happens as the next four years or the next eight years come on. But what I see outside every day, no. I mean, there's nobody. I mean, how can you make changes for something that's not happening now? What do you mean? You know, how so can you make promises to the world or to the people for issues that are ongoing, that have been ongoing for many, many years that hasn't been resolved? Like what? like um, the health care, the mentally ill, um, upper wages uh, for people that's working, minimum wage. I mean, we're still fighting a whole lot of issues that's going, been going on for years that hasn't changed, so they're talking about the wrong things. They're, they're truly talking about the wrong, what about the things that matter, that we stop killing each other, that we treat each other like human beings. What about those type of things? Yeah, and what about happen with, with proper police training? You know, when you're dealing with the anyone, mentally ill. Anyone, especially the mentally yeah, ill. Yeah, especially but, the but mentally ill. anyone, how you treat them. Because you wear a badge, you can do what you want? No. People have rights. That's right. They have rights. That's right. Have any of the people running for office in this election come talk to you? No. No. Nobody from the city's been to talk to us. To this day. Does a new government or a new leader alone deliver on the promise of change that people so desperately need? Next up, we're going to talk to two community organizers who are doing that work from the bottom up. Rowena Ventura is with Common Good Ohio and Malaya Davis is with the Ohio Students Association. Rowena, Malaya, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Does this deliver, does this electoral system deliver the kind of change that you see that you need? I think what presidential elections do, does every four years is it, um, it's like an alarm clock for the American psyche. It's like, hey folks, it's time to wake up, things are happening, you should pay attention to um, the politics um, and the, you know, the politics that are happening on the state level, on the local level, but definitely the federal, national level. Um, but I think this election cycle around it's making people wake up in a very particular way because of the current events that are happening outside of um, the presidential election that are happening in our country. All right, so wake up, but wake up to what? What, what, do we, what, do we, what do we need to wake up to? We need to wake up and use our voice 
and empower other people to use their voice because we have people that in this convention that are making decisions and policies about things that are affecting people um, here in Cleveland and across the country, then they have no clue of how it really will affect us. Like what? what? What are you worried about most? What do you hear in your community people are most worried about? I think people are worried about being able to survive in so many different ways and, and being able to feel safe and be able to have a job and be able to have quality education. Um, and for specifically in the black community, because that's the perspective that I can talk about, I can say that I haven't heard that perspective or any, any solutions or any talk about that other than the language that organizers are using, that organizers are putting out there and saying that th these are the demands, this is what we're demanding as a community that presidential hopefuls are now talking about. So like what? What, what is, the, is needed in your community as you organize with Common Good Ohio, Rowena? Um, we need living wages. We need jobs that provide benefits for families so that uh, parents don't have to work two and three jobs. They can actually be a part of their child's life. Um, those are the things that immediate needs right now. Um, they need access to education and training for jobs so that um, they can continue to um, provide for their families. And I've heard a lot of people this election talk about, well, we're promising jobs, we're promising education, free education. They've free. promised that for so long, mm -hmm. every, uh, every election cycle. We hear the same things and um, we're, we actually are now standing up and fighting for those things and not just taking your word for it. We want it and we're gonna get it, we're gonna get it. So exactly. What, so what will make the difference? So, and I think that that is where community organizing comes into play because as organizers, we see the power in the people. We don't see the power lying in one presidential hope for a one candidate or you know anybody in political office we see the power in the people and so our jobs is to say like hey things are happening and they're happening in your community you're, these aren't happening in silos and we can do something about it together how is your organizing reflected in that idea our organizing here in in Cleveland is I think um, not unique to um, the country. I think we have to unite all the people. Um, I think we have to understand what poverty is and actually how it affects people's lives and, and empower them to change that. And one person is not going to do that, especially if they don't understand mm -hmm. what poverty is. So how do you confront an electoral system that teaches us that power is all about what's at the top and who's at the top and that our role essentially in a democracy is to cast a vote once every four or eight years? Well, I think that comes from an organized community. I think that comes from an, a community that understands um, how these policies, laws, and different uh, uh, political positions affect their everyday lives. What could people do to organize where they live, their street, their block, their church? Like it starts as simple as having a conversation with folks that you know are in your community about what are some of the issues that you're dealing with. And it takes a, a level of vulnerability to be able to do that, to say, hey, I'm struggling with this thing, and I want to come to you and say that because I, I know that I'm not going through this alone, and that there are people who aren't struggling who are making these decisions for us to continue to struggle in this way. And together, we can, you know, we can make something happen. Marina, want to Absolutely. That? Make sure that people feel safe in being able to come out into that conversation is the most critical mm -hmm. thing. Because when you're isolated, you feel like you're alone and you're doing this yourself, when you get a room full of people that have the same issues, mm -hmm. you have power and you feel empowered. Exactly. You don't feel like, oh, this is just happening to me, I'm alone. I can, we can actually do something together. And that, that is the biggest thing, is to come together. Next stop, Philadelphia. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have you. Rowena Ventura of Common Good Ohio and Malaya Davis from the Ohio Students Association. Thank you both. Great to have you. So that's just about it for our show from Cleveland, Ohio and the Republican National Convention this week. Next week we'll be in Philadelphia. But before we go, just these thoughts. The conversation in the mainstream media this week has all been about, is there unity at the RNC? People we spoke to saw more unity than they're comfortable with. What they saw scared them inside the convention. But outside, there's a lot going on the media didn't see that isn't scary, that's actually encouraging, exciting. People came together to talk about what needs to happen in their communities. They didn't see a solution coming from the Trump campaign. Will they see it coming from the Democrats? Watch the show next week. Thanks. I'm Laura Flanders.
stream. Every